loving, gracious Lord. I thank you, God, that on the condition that you move and that you do and the way that you use me will not be based on any good thing that I can do or have done. But Lord, you do your work because of your goodness and long-suffering nature. And so, Father, I beg you right now that your kindness and your mercies may be manifested. Lord, I pray that you may appeal to me as I appeal to my friends. Together we may be encouraged and inspired to live better for you. Lord, we thank you for this privilege and for this blessed Sunday day, a day of celebration, a day of rejoicement of your goodness. Father, I pray that you may pour out your Holy Spirit, that today, Father, we may walk up from this place and say, God, has our heart not burned, oh Father? Lord, we love you and thank you for your goodness in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessed Sabbath Church. The text in which I was inspired to begin with is in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. The Bible says, My children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteousness. Friends, in this very text that I've just read to you, the Bible tells us that if any man sins, we have an advocate. In other words, we have a lawyer. We have a lawyer, and his name is Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus, he sits, he works in the most holy place right now. And if any time in your own life, in your own spiritual work, you feel low, you feel like no one can understand you. You feel like you don't have words to describe the, the pain of how much you are sorry for your action. Friends, let me warm your heart this morning and tell you that we have a lawyer, Christ Jesus, who understands you. And he's a man that you cannot appeal to. Not because he knows the book of the law, but friends, because he has taken the human nature and he understands everyone's weakness and everyone's limits. Friends, we have a lawyer, Christ Jesus, whom you can go to with all your problems and anxieties. Friends, I'm so thankful that I have a king, a king of kings. Though today I cannot go to see King Charles because I don't hold any, any honorable titus, title in my life. Friends, I praise God that I can go to the king of kings with a, with a title called the chief of sinners. And God is most delighted to accept me and listen to me whatever situation that I'm going through. Friends, I just want to begin this presentation by telling you this, that Jesus Christ is in the most holy place. He's in the most holy place doing one special work. He is interceding for you and me. Every time you go to, to pray, ah, the devil rises up and says, look at this lukewarm Christian. They have come to you 20, 20 billion times. How many times would you accept them, Father? How many times would you accept them, be God? But ah, uh, Jesus Christ, friends. He rises up his hands that, that he was crucified upon. And upon the palms of his hands is the name of every sincere, repentant sinner. And because of that name that is given upon your hand, is the reason why Jesus, is the reason why God accepts you. Amen. Friends, even in this very moment, you can approach the throne of God. Even in the very moment when you're sitting down, you can say, be alone, be alone my broken prayer. Hear my prayer, dear Lord. And friends, God can hear you. And he can do great and marvelous things in your life. But friends, in saying that, I want to let you know that Jesus Christ is coming. I should get an amen for that. Amen. Friends, he's coming to get back his children. He's coming to get back those who have been afflicted in life. You know, friends, the Bible says, precious is the death of the, of the saints. You know why the death of the saints is precious to the Lord? Because it's an end to a life of, suffer, of sorrow. It's an end to a life of pain. It's an end to a life of misery. It's an end to a life of a broken home. It's an end, it's an end to a life of a family that never has peace in their life. Precious is the death of the saints in the eyes of the Lord. Yes, friends. 
the second coming of Jesus Christ is a precious event to, this, to, to God himself. Because it's a time where God will see an end to all the suffering and pain that exists in this world. Friends, Jesus Christ is coming. Yes, friends, you best believe it. Jesus Christ is coming. Amen. He's coming to give us what? To give a reward to all those who have been faithful to his word. But can I tell you this, that there's also another second reason why Jesus Christ is coming. The Bible tells me in the book of Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 21. Go with me, right there with me. Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 21. And when you're there, you let me know by saying, Amen. Now, you know my tradition when I read. I like to read, and every time I pause at a word, I want you guys to fill in the, the spot. I want you guys to say the following word. Here we have two engagements. It helps me know that you guys are focusing, and no one, no one is falling asleep. As well, it helps me know that I'm not too boring, so everybody's engaged. Amen? All right, so the Bible tells us. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place. His place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. For earth shall also disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. So from the text in which we have read, we see that God himself says that he is coming soon. All right? He is coming soon to, to unfortunately do away with all those who do, who practice wickedness. But I want you to understand, friends, the Bible says that God is coming back again to do away, to punish the inhabitants of the earth who practice iniquity. Question, what is iniquity? Iniquity is sin, but it's a deliberate, intentional sin. Ah, friends, have you ever prayed in your life? Father, forgive me. But to only walk out, wait, walk away from that very prayer, walking to the very thing you say, God forgive me. That's what you call deliberate, intentional sin. Question. If God is going to do away with the wicked at the end of the world, why does he not do it today? Why does he not eliminate sinners right now? Go with me to the book of e e Ecclesiastes, chapter 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 11. When you're there, you let me know by saying amen. amen. Have you ever wanted to yourself, before you read this, have you ever wanted to yourself, if God's going to do away with all those who practice iniquity, why does he not do it today? Why does he not end those people who bring terror to this world? All right? In the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 11, the Bible says, because sentence against an evil work is not execute speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of man are fully set in them to do what? No. Catch me, dear friend. The text in which we have just read, the Bible tells us, because judgment, because what? Because judgment is not executed immediately. The Bible says, that is the reason why the wicked flourish. You know why? The wicked flourish, friends, is because soon I told you the answer, God does not execute judgment. Oh, you better listen to me now. In the same way, why the wicked flourish, live on, being unpunished at this present time, is simply because God still has hope in the very sinner who deliberately lives a life of boldness of sin, that there will be a day of repentance for them. Friends, the reason why each and every single human lives today 
despite though they're living a life in contrary to the will of God, is because hope and grace is still reigning in their lives. Friends, I want to tell you this, there is hope for you. Because if God himself executed sinner, none of us would be living today. In fact, right now, God will zap us in a, in a, in a split second. But friends, I want to tell you this, that today you are living, you are breathing, because of the mercies and the graces of God in your life. Friends, the Bible says in the book of Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, and the Lord God breathed, and the Lord God breathed into man the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Friends, go to some light text that I just quoted to you. That Adam, in order for him to become a living soul, he had the breath of God. In other words, the spirit of God in his life. Indicating that it is by the spirit of grace that each and every single one of us are had today is the reason why that God is living. The reason why we are living. You look at a man who's a Satanist, who's lived a life of open boldness, of open boldness against God. You wonder to yourself, why doesn't this Satanist die? Imagine, he's living to the age of 100. And guess what? He's even writing books of Satan, Satanism. And you wonder to yourself, why doesn't God destroy, eliminate this individual? Friends, the reason why God doesn't destroy that person, that Satanist, is the reason why he doesn't destroy you. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say, friends, just as God gives you breath to breathe, because he has hope in you and me, God also has hope in that Satanist. That maybe on the last breath on his deathbed, maybe he might be then, he might alter the very words that that thief on the cross altered in his life. Friends, that is the God that I serve. In the book of Exodus, chapter 34, God goes to proclaim his name. He named, meaning his character. God goes to proclaim his what? Name or character. And guess what? He says this. God says, I am merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity and transgression that will by no means clear the guilt. And then he goes on to say, visiting the iniquities of the fathers unto the third and fourth generation. But friends, I want you to notice, prior before God goes to tell us that in his character, there is a character that admits judgment. There is a character that, actually, that, that conforms judgment. He says, I am loving, kind, merciful. Therefore, indicating, therefore telling us, anytime anybody experiences the judgment of God is because they have disregarded, they have rejected every goodness of God that has been shown into their own life. If you didn't know the sermon today, the sermon is probation. We are living in a time, friends, I say, it's probational time. Listen to what Ellen White says. And then what I said, God allows man a period of probation, but there is a point beyond which divine patience is, is exhausted, and the judgment of God are sure to follow. The Lord bears long with man, and with cities mercifully giving warnings to save them from divine wrath. But a time will come when pleadings for mercy will no longer be heard. And the rebellious element that continuously reject the light of truth will be blotted out. In mercy to themselves and to those who would otherwise be influenced by their example. You know what probation is, friends? Probation, when you have a probation period, right? I, have, I go to school. I tell you what probation is. I go to school. Isolate a subject 
I've got three weeks to make up my mind if I want to change from that subject. But if I don't choose to get out of that subject, guess what happens? My probation is over, meaning, therefore, I am liable to pay for that subject. Are you following? Humanity, we are living on a life, we are li this is the period of probation we call it. Are you following? When Christ himself comes, that probational period is over. Now, the question somebody may be asking is this. How do we know how close Jesus Christ is coming? How what? How do we know how close Jesus Christ is coming? Go with me to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 24. And when you there, you let me know by saying, Amen. Now, do you know that Jesus Christ in the book of Matthew chapter 24, he's telling us the signs of the time. He's telling us what? And do you know that there's an order? There's a what? An order he tells us, he tells his disciples the signs of the time. Indicating that when we actually follow these signs that Jesus Christ told, foretold us, they are actually going to happen in order one after the other. They're going to what? Happen one after the other. I just want to focus on the last two. On the last two great signs of Jesus' name is coming. Over the what? Last two. All right. The Bible says this. And because in, verse 12. And the Bible says, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall what? Wax cold. All right. But he that shall endure unto the end, the shame shall be what? Saved. And verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end what? Come. These were the last and final message, signs that Jesus Christ told his disciples of when he would be coming. Oh boy, now listen to me. Focus on verse 4. He says this, right? And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. In other words, what Jesus Christ was saying here, and because of sin, in other words, the love of many, the love of many towards one another, the love of many towards God will grow weaker and weaker. Uh, you're not listening to me, church. Don't mind my silence. I have dramatic silence when I speak. It's for the Holy Spirit to talk to you. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48, He says, Be ye therefore perfect, just as your heavenly Father in heaven is what? Perfect. Do you know, when you read the previous verses, Jesus is saying, says this, Your God in heaven, He sends rain to the just and the unjust. Are you hearing? And then when he says that, he then says, Be ye therefore, just as your heavenly Father in heaven is. So the illustration, so what Jesus Christ was actually trying to say is this. Be perfect in showing love to those people who do bad towards you, just as God in heaven shows kindness to those people who boldly live a life of iniquity. So in other words, true perfection is best shown when we show love to those who oppress us, to those who are deliberately mean to us. Come on now. Away with all the other, I'm bored because of how I dress today. God, in the eyes of God, never are we seen to be more pure, never are we seen to be more holy, then when we continuously show a consistent love towards our kids, towards our wives, towards our neighbor, who are made to us. Let me read to you a story of a minister. You know what? Listen to me.
into this. A minister who was a preacher outside, but a dictator inside his home. Ellen White wrote to him saying, You talk the truth, but you do not carry its principles in your everyday life. You are short-tempered and unforgiving. Your children and wife do not love you because you make it hard for them to love you. You reserve your encouraging words and kindly acts to others who you wish to think highly of you, but not, but not for your own family. Your children have lost confidence in, in you and despite the truth and despise the truth you profess. Humble your poor, proud hearts. Seize from fault finding in your life. The work you have now to do is to overcome your own wrong. Make your wife comfortable and happy first. Then consider the condition of your children before caring for others. Showing affection, interest, care, and love to your family will be the foundation of your happy home. Stop going around going to people, oh, you know present truth, you know present truth, when the present truth has not worked for change in your own life. This minister, he knew how to do this to his wife. But he forgot there was three fingers pointing at him. Kids, before they know God, they know God through you. Kids, before they are persuaded to accept God's love, to accept God's mercy, they will first learn it from you. Just as you delay to approach them after you've done wrong, that is how they think of God. God, I cannot approach him because he has not yet, I don't think I'm worthy enough to be approached by God. Matthew 24. Matthew 24. So from the first that we've just seen, Jesus Christ giving us the signs of the time of the end of the world, he tells us that one of the big significant signs of his name is coming will be the love of many towards their family members, the love of many towards the church members will actually go what? Weaker and what? Weaker. What is separating the church than anything? What's killing the church more than anything? Relationship. Did I need something called gossip? Have you ever, have you ever read the stories of a man who was the rich man? Who went, the, the rich man and Lazarus? The rich man who was where? Downstairs, hell, right? What did he request out of all things? That his tongue be cool. Have you ever questioned yourself, why, was his, why did he request for his tongue to be cool? You see, friends, the thing that got him there hurt the most. That will be, be the second last sign, right? And then, verse 14, Jesus tells us the final. What? The final. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached away in all the world for a unto all nation, and then shall what? The end come. I want you to notice Jesus Christ said, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. Notice that Jesus Christ does not say this. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, and the whole world will accept it. Notice that Jesus Christ didn't say this. And this gospel shall be preached but in all the world, and the world will love it. Mm -mm. Notice he doesn't say that. But what he says, whether people accept it, whether people accept my message, whether people accept the word of God, this gospel will be preached despite their reactions. But the very word in which they reject will be a witness against them on the day of judgment. Different story now, huh? Notice that's the conclusion of the whole matter. Whether you choose to accept today's message, whether you say this guy is too boring, whether you say this and that and that, the word of God will be what? A witness against what? Our decision today. Yeah. 
Now, this is my third pot that's coming up. Romans chapter 10, verse 15. Oh. Romans chapter 10. Romans, when you're there, just let me know by saying amen. Let me tell you this. Let me tell you something. Do you know the reason why there is a dysfunctioning home? Do you know the reason why all the issues, all the problems exist today? Oh boy. Oh boy. It's because of the answer that I'm about to give you in Matthew, in Romans chapter 10, verse 15. Alright. What is the gospel? And the Bible says, How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of what? Peace. So in other words, the gospel that Jesus Christ, he says that will go all to the world, is the gospel of what? Peace. In other words, it's a message of what? Peace. In other words, the reason why there is a low, warm love for one another is because we don't ourselves don't carry this gospel in our lives. Because if we truly carry this gospel, it's meant to bring peace. That's meant to be the end result of, our, of, the, of, of what it means when we have the gospel of peace. I'll say it again different. When you have the gospel of peace, you, you, possess, you, you possess to have the gospel of peace, right? When you have the gospel, which is a message of peace, are you following me? When you have the gospel of peace, what it should do is should create peace in your life. Not just peace in your life, it should also create peace between you and your fellow friends. And I've come to the conclusion. For the, the reason why there is so many problems is because, unfortunately, we don't actually have this gospel of peace actually in our lives, in ourselves. And I'm going to show you something very different. The Bible asks us a question in the book of Romans. How shall they preach unless they be sent? So those people who preach the gospel of peace are those people who are first sent. But I've got another challenge on you. How can you preach something that you don't have? How can you give something that you don't have? How can you hope to give peace to others when you don't have peace in yourself? I hear what I'm trying to say. So in other words, when you really have the peace of God in your life, when you really have the gospel which creates peace within you, are you following me? That peace will flow out of you like a stream of water and it will affect everyone in your home to also really have peace. So what I'm going to say again, when we are seeing a dysfunctioning home, when we are seeing a disunified church, it's because we simply are lacking peace. Because when we truly have the gospel of peace, we should what? Bring forth peace. The church is deficient in what? Peace. I tell you, friends, when we look at the gospel, it's not, a, it's not all gloom and doom. The final work that Jesus wants to do is to restore the home, is to restore the church by bringing forth peace. Question. Do I have that peace in my life? Now listen to me. Did you know the gospel of peace is connected to the sacrifice of peace offering? I repeat again. Did you know that the offering of peace is connected to the gospel? And I'm going to show you. Go with me to the book of Leviticus, chapter 3. Leviticus, chapter 3. When you there, say, Amen. Because, friends, I believe when we can get this message right today and understanding the sacrifice, the peace offering, all right, I believe that this will actually begin to create a radical change in our lives and in our relationship with one another, but as well in the relationship with us and God, all right. I believe that when we can get this particular message that I'm about to present to you, 
it's going to reaffirm your strength, your relationship with God, but also your relationship with one another. Are you following me? Because if there's anything that we are utmost and need of in our lives, it's literally peace. Is it not? It's peace. Everyone's hope is broken. Everyone's church is somewhat broken. Are you following? But friends, I'm here to tell you that there is a remedy that we can find when we search the scriptures earnestly. Alrighty. And the Bible tells us in the book of Leviticus chapter 3. Now, this was a condition of a peace offering. I'll read it to you and I'll break it down. Alright? The Bible says this. And if this obli- oblation be a sacrifice of peace offering, if he offer it of the herd, where if it be a male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. Okay. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of, of his offering and kill it at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron's sons and the priest shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. And he shall offer of all the sacrifice of the peace offering an offering made by fire unto the Lord, that the fat that covereth the inwards and all the fat that is upon the inwards and the two kidneys and the fat that is upon them, which by the flanks and the core above the liver, with the kidneys and he take it away. And Aaron's son shall burn it on the altar upon the burnt sacrifice, which is, which is upon the wood that is on the fire, it is an offering made by fire of sweet savior unto the Lord. All right. So many things that I've just read to you, but I'm going to break it down. All right? I'm going to what? All right, break it down. Okay. So in the Old Testament, when somebody was grateful, was what? And was thankful for something that has happened in their life, they brought a peace offering. They made a peace offering. Are you following me? Friends, are you thankful for something that has happened in your life? Well, if that was you in the old times, are you following me? You will bring an animal as a peace offering, as an attitude of God, I'm so thankful for what you've done for me. Are you following me? Before I even say it further, you see, as I told you, the gospel of peace is connected to the peace of offering. And I ask you a question. How can you give something that you do not? When you really have the gospel, when you really have when you really, really know what God has done for you, you cannot hold back, but you must what? Give it up to the world as an act of gratitude for what God has done for you. Are you following? All right. So the peace offering was significant because it was an attitude of thankfulness and of what God has done for you. Okay? But the Bible tells us that when somebody brought an offering, the offering had to be blemished. It had to be what? Blemish. Blemish because it was the nature of Jesus Christ. Right? Jesus Christ was blemished, so the animal was always a representation of Jesus Christ who was to come. Alright? And then the Bible tells us that the second significant thing that individual had to do is lay their hands upon the offering. They had to what? Alrighty. What is the laying of the head? Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 21. What does the laying of the hand signify? When you they let it by saying, Amen. And the Bible says this. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat, and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgression in all their sins. So the lying of their hands was a confession of sins. Are you following? All right. And then another significant thing, the third significant thing we saw is that the person who brought the, the animal, they had to cut, they had to kill the innocent lamb. 
and then that individual will catch the blood in a bowl, all right, as we can see in that picture. And then what he then had to do, the Bible says, he had to take the fat, the what? The fat of that animal. And then the Bible tells us that that fat of the animal was then burnt. Was then what? I wonder what does the fat mean? What does the fat mean in the Bible? Alrighty, go with me to the book of Psalms, uh, chapter 37. Oh, and you let me know by saying amen. Psalms 37 and verse 20. Alrighty, when you let me know by saying amen. And the Bible tells us, but the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of the lambs. They shall consume into a into smoke, shall they consume away. So the Bible compares the wicked or sinners as the fat of the lamb. So in other words, the fat that that individual took from that lamb was the sin of that animal. Oh Lord, give me wisdom to explain this point right now. The Bible says this in the book of Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hands not short that he cannot, nor is his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But the Bible tells us, but our iniquities have what? Separated us from who? The act of that individual taking the fact of that animal, separating that fact from that animal, he was choosing to separate himself from that very thing that was disconnecting him from God who brings peace in his life. Did you guys catch that? That was the significance of an individual taking the fat of the animal. He was choosing to set himself away from that very thing that disconnects him with God. But in order for him to get that fat, he had to search through the animal. He had to what? In other words, he had to assess the very thing that was disconnecting him from God. He had to assess the very things in his own life which might be a contributor to why there is no peace in his own life. Question. What is that present attitude? What is that present substance? What is that present thing that is only causing unpeace and unsettlement in your own life? That was the significance of why he had to search through the animal and bring out the facts. So going back to the gospel, the gospel is a, is a message of and those who preach it are those who have first experienced and they are preaching it in gratitude to what God has done for them. But in order for them to preach, they're not just saying, God, I thank you for you being so good. But they're saying, thank you for forgiving my sins and I want everyone else to experience the peace that you've worked in my life. Amen. So they are trying to help others experience the peace of heaven. And this is the message, friends, that will end the world. No sooner do we experience peace in our life than when we choose to set ourselves apart from the very things that disconnect us from God. Come on, friends. I'll repeat again. No sooner do we experience the peace of heaven than when we choose to connect ourselves. Well, no, than when we choose to separate ourselves from that very thing that separates us from God. So the reason why those who can preach the gospel of peace that literally ends the world is because they've chosen to separate themselves from the very thing that hurts the heart of God. It aches my father that my sins cause him pain till today. And so friends, they are individuals in whom that turn to God. 
and have said, Lord, I desire you to work a change in my life. And because of that change, that's the reason why they're standing out preaching the gospel. Stephen N. Hosko, our pioneer, an Adventist pioneer, he says this. The reason why we go to Jesus and confess our sins, but still fail to have peace, the peace of heaven, is because we trust Jesus with the little affairs of our life while we put our full confidence in our worldly friends. We trust Jesus with the little problems. And we trust Jesus to manage with the little issues of our lives, but we fully put our confidence in our worldly friends. He says that's the reason why we struggle to have peace in our lives. John, when he saw Jesus Christ, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. He said, friends, behold the Lamb of God, which takes the sins of the world. You know, friends, when Adam and Eve sinned, God brought a lamb. A lamb that did nothing. And you know what Adam was ordered to do? He was ordered to slaughter the juggler vein of that innocent animal. And friends, as Adam saw the blood of that animal flowing down to the ground, tears flowed from his cheeks and mingled with the innocent blood of that dead animal. And God, the Bible tells us that Adam, he was clothed with the skin of a dead animal. You know who that dead animal was actually the representation of? Jesus Christ. You see, the new garment in which Adam and Eve received after their sin was a garment that was a continuous reminder of their sins and of the one that died to save them from, from their sins. Friends, that is a garment that Jesus Christ was to clothe each and every single one of us. I had a friend. I was walking, I was yesterday I was I was walking in the park. And this particular friend, he came to me. And we just had caught up, we just caught up because I hadn't seen him for a long time. And he started telling me all about the relationship because he's soon to be married. About what? Relationship, he's soon to be married. And so this particular man, he tells me that, ah, love is blind. He tells me love is blind. Love is what? Blind. I looked at him and I said, brother, love is not blind. Any form of love that you call blind or love at first sight is what we call infatuation. In other words, your hormones are exploding inside you like fireworks and you don't actually love that person for who they are. And I told him, hey brother, I'll tell you a quotation of Ellen White. And I said this, Ellen White says in the testimonies, true love is not a hasty, it, true love is not a strong, fiery, hasty passion. On the contrary, it is calm and deep in its nature. It looks beyond the external features and, and is attracted to qualities alone. I said, brother, 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 what the lady was actually telling us is this. True love, when you truly love somebody, love operates calmly, it operates slowly. Because it's focusing on the qualities of that person. It's focusing, it's focusing on an... A, a, appreciating that individual for that for who they are than what they can give you. Hey, boy. And, so, and I said, this is what the lady says, that's what we call true love. Because if there's any reason why you are attracted to that individual for their looks, I tell you the truth, the moment they get into a car accident, then their face looks like this, and then they look like this, and weird completely. I tell you, you will not be standing beside that person wanting to kiss them again. I know of a minister himself. His wife, unfortunately, I don't know what happened to her. She's completely paralyzed, face gone. And, and he scoops soup, puts her in, a, in, a, in her mouth. She swallows, and he gets something and wipes her off. And 
It's like as if they just met each other for the first time. Love, the way that he treats love. Boy, from that moment, I said to myself, Lord, create a love in me for whoever. That's what you call true love. And anyways, we are talking, and he's like, he seems to be interested. But for some reason, he wants to, because he, he's a preacher, so he wants to act like as if he, he can't be taught anything. But he tries to ask me questions, actually, about himself. He's like, brother, how about if somebody has done this and has done this, has engaged in lots of stuff like this, you know, they've slept many times and all that stuff. Brother, what do you say about that individual? Ah, you see, when he was trying to talk to me, I realized he was actually trying to describe his own life. But he was just too, too proud to admit himself. Uh, looking at him, I said, brother, I can tell you one thing only. Everyone in life makes, pro makes, makes, a, makes, makes a mess. I said this. Friend, there's always a first time to doing something. But there doesn't have to be a second time to it. I will tell you again. There's always a first time to doing something that you know you shouldn't do. There's always a first time to watching something that you shouldn't watch. There's always a first time to behave in a way that you know you shouldn't behave. But friends, let me tell you this. There doesn't have to be a second time for you doing the same thing again. Uh, looking at his face, I still saw that he was not yet persuaded in the word that I said. I said, you know, in a friend, I told the brother, you know, in the Bible, there's a guy called Joshua. Joshua discovers that somebody has stolen a Babylonian garment and some couple of jewelry, gold elements, from Jericho, a city that was destroyed and cursed. And the Bible tells us that Joshua, he, 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 he literally lies onto the ground. He, he's literally facing onto the ground. He refuses to rise up because he's absolutely hurt. The Bible says that his face was on the ground from morning to evening. Then God tells him, Joshua, what are you doing on your face? Get up from your face and go find out who has sinned against me. The word to Joshua was, get up from your face. You know why God told Joshua to get up from your face? Because the Lord does not actually delight when, you, when we remain in a sinking spirit. Did you catch what I just said? The Lord does not delight when we choose to remain in a sinking spirit. Friends, let me tell you something. You are best to come to the Lord when life is at its worst. Your best prayers are said then. The promises of God act like a mother hold, holding a hopeless baby. Your sorrowful, your sorrowful moment becomes God's joyful moment. The existence of God is reaffirmed when you think to yourself, how could there be a God who forgives a, such a sinner like me after the many sins that I've committed? His gentle and soft character becomes readable through nature. Hosea chapter 14 verse 4, he says, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for my anger is turned away from them. God is appealing to the nation of Israel. And he says, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. Friends, notice in the text that I've quoted to you. God says that to the nation of Israel who have backsliding. He will love them freely. Yes, friends. The nature of somebody who chooses to turn their hearts towards God. God promises to you that he will love you freely. Friends, the love of God towards you is not something that you can work for. Neither is it something that, that you can persuade him to give to you. But friends, it's, an, it's a natural reaction of God towards anyone that chooses him in his life. I was reading a quotation, and in the Prophets and King, Ellen White says this, that it is Satan's special device, Satan's special what? Device to lead men into sin and to leave them there feeling hopeless and helpless. Feeling hopeless and helpless. Although at times fearing that he cannot come to seek pardon for his sins, the Savior invites him, saying, saying this, as the Bible says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 27, and verse 5. Yes, 27, verse 
verse 5, it says, Let him take hold on my strength, that he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me. Friends, that is the invitation that God gives each and every single one of us. Notice that God desires to give you peace. But in order for you to experience the peace, he says, hold on my strength. Meaning, therefore, you've got to let go of yourself. You've got to let go of anything that persuades you to think of that God loves you because you do what you do. Notice it says, let him take hold on my strength that he may make peace with me and he shall make peace with me. Friends, God wants to make peace in your life. But you first got to let go. You got to let go of self-confidence. You got to let go of anything that you think makes you worthy in the sight of God. There's nothing that makes you worthy in the sight of God. It's only goodness, it's only God's natural reaction towards you, friend, that is our surest foundation, our surest safety. The Bible says what? Let him take hold of my strength. Some of us are holding on to something that is not giving us strength, but only killing us. You know, there's a story of a monkey in Africa. In Africa, they have a monkey that sometimes they want to catch it. They want to what? In Africa, they always want to catch things and eat things. And so one method in how these people use to try to catch this monkey is that they have a, a bow. They have a what? A bow. And you know what the monkey just has to do? The monkey comes and they put nuts inside, right? The monkey thrusts his hand inside that, monkey, in that, that bowl, right? And when the people come, the monkey sees the people. You know what the monkey does? He shouts because he wants to run away. But he can't run away because he's got his hand stuck in the what? In the bowl. But you know the solution to that monkey? You know what the solution is? The monkey just simply needs to what? Let go. He screams and screams and screams, but he simply needs to what? Let go. Let go and he'll be free. Let go and he'll be at peace. And some of us are holding on to something that's not just that's going to ruin our lives. Some of us have things that we need to let go. We need to let go because I'm not creating peace in our life. Why has your life been the same? Why has your life been the same way for the last thirty years, ten years, five years? You need to let go. It's not working. Friend. Go with me to the book of Chronicles. We're coming to a conclusion. Chronicles, First Chronicles, chapter twenty-one. First Chronicles chapter twenty-one. So you got Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. Judges, are we there? First Chronicles chapter 21. The conclusion to all things. And the Bible tells us in verse 14, right? So the Lord sent pestilence upon where? Israel. And they fell how many? 70,000. Okay. So there was a plague that God sent out, and how many people did it kill? 70,000. You know why God sent that plague? You know what David did? Okay, this is what David did. David, the Bible says, he gathered the men of war, men of war, and he asked Joab, his commander of war, the commander, in, uh, the chief commander, and he says, Joab, I want you to go throughout all Israel and gather men who can fight, and just tell me how many they are. And just what? Tell me how many they are. Is there a problem in that? No. They're just simply saying, tell me how many they are. As if perhaps he's forgotten how many men he has in his own country. But anyway, he's saying, tell me how many they are. But I wonder if it was a problem. But when you read verse 21, let us see who was motivating him. Who was what? In motivating him, influencing him to do that. The Bible says this. And, uh, 21 verse 1. And 
Satan stood up against and provoked David to what? Pause. So what we see, it was who was motivating David to do what he did? The devil, right? And the Bible says, and David said to Joab, to the rulers of the of the people, go number Israel from Beersheba even to, and bring the number there of them to me, that I may know it. From this very text, we see that who was the one leading David to do the thing that he was doing. You know why it was a problem? Because David didn't ask that the man of war be numbered for just curious reasons. He did it out of pride for heart. He did it to magnify himself in the eyes of man. Look what I have. Look what I can do. Look what I built myself to be. And because of this prideful attitude, God strike the nation with a plague that killed 70,000 people. I wonder what things have I done in my life when I think about this situation. In the eyes of men, I've looked okay, but truly inside, there was a different intention to be recognized. I wonder when I look at myself, when I look at the life of David, I wonder in my life, where have I represented the same lifestyle of David? In the eyes of men, I've looked good, trying to be pleasing and trying to be a good Christian, but in the eyes of of men, I look good, but in my own heart, there was a desire to be seen and to be recognized for my action. That was the plague that cost the life of 70,000 people. The Bible says this in the book of Proverbs 15, verse 11, 22, I believe it is. It says that Foolishness abounds in the heart. Foolishness abounds in the heart. What abounds in the heart? And then he goes on to say, correct a child. Correct what? A child with the rod, and he shall drive the foolishness from his heart. The judgment that David experienced was a rebuke to drive the foolishness to pride that was in his heart. But friends, despite though David knowing God was angry, I want you to look at the attitude of David. I want you to what? Look at the attitude of David. And he says in verse 22, the Bible says, And David said unto God, I am in a great strait, let me fall into the hand of the Lord. For every great are his mercies. For very great are his mercies. When David knew that God was angry at him, he said, just let me to God. He said to God, let me fall into the hand of God. Into the hand of who? For great is his mercies. Great is his mercy. Friends, I don't know where life has taken you. I don't know where you are within your life. But friends, when we find ourselves like David, unworthy to receive the mercies of God for, for having done a sinful lifestyle, friends, we have an encouragement looking at the life of David. We can fall into the hands of God, for great is his mercy. Conclusion, I'll tell you a story. There's a story of a man who was waiting for his bus. So the story goes like this. There's a story of a gentleman waiting for his bus was approached by a street preacher who invited him to church. The gentleman asked, what is the point of going to church when the church is like a hospital? full of sick people who are hypocrites, thieves, liars, adulterers, and drug addicts, replied the preacher. Ah, that is correct. And there's still room for one more. The preacher continuing said, those who are strong and well have no need of a physician. 
But those who are weak and sick, I came not to call the righteous ones to repentance, but sinners. Sir, said the preacher, if you are a righteous person, Jesus did not come for you. However, if you are humble enough to admit your blindness and say, Lord, open my eyes to see my need. Lord, help me to will to love you. Do not give me rest until I have found you. It is then, and only then, you will partake the joy every sense and soul experiences at church. The man came with the same mind everybody comes to church with. What is the purpose? What is the, what is, what is the purpose of going to church when the church is full of gossip? When the church is full of lies? When church is full of this, church is full of this. Ah, yes, said the preacher. But let me tell you something, friends. There's still room for one more. There's still room for one more. I don't know whose life is still weighing in the battle. But perhaps there is somebody within their own life that wants to publicly, boldly say, Father, I choose you right now because I find more reason to choose you than to, not you, than, than to reject you. And friends, if that is someone who's up, and God's mercies has outweighed your sins, has outpowered your sins and your fears, and it's a personal prayer that, that is within your heart, and you want to publicly declare to the kingdom of darkness, I want to choose Jesus Christ. I encourage you to rise up on your feet as a public declaration. Is there anyone whom the Lord is speaking to? Amen. Friends, time is short. And Jesus Christ, if he could have waited long enough it was all waiting for one for somebody. Because Jesus Christ found that heaven not to be a place to be desired if some of us were never there. Friends, is this someone's language in their heart that they want to give a chance for God to make a change in their life, especially in their interaction, especially towards their family members, and they especially know how close Christ is coming. Uh, sometimes we don't need to look into the world to know how Christ is coming. I must believe that our lives are fulfilling the signs of Christ in his coming than anything else. Our lives are an evident testimony of how close Christ is coming. But that someone's life, it might be possible. But you want to personally say, Lord, I desire to let go. We give an invitation for the fight. The Lord is calling. And stand only if God himself is especially appealing to you. Especially appealing to you. If there's somebody we're going on. We're going on to friends. Don't worry about who looks. It's just you and God at the end of the day. Praise the Lord. Just you and God towards the end of the day. It's you and God at the end of the day. But if Jesus Christ could have extended a day before he comes, let's believe, friends, it is that, it would, it is that for that individual who makes time work, who makes a wise decision when time is available. Friends, how long will you have Jesus Christ waiting? I ask once again, just for anyone who's just hovering at their seat, desiring to actually boldly claim, Lord, I desire you. Friends, I appeal to you that by the grace of God, you pray in your very heart, Lord, give me the strength to us.
And leave a little moment of silence. As everybody wages the war within their own heart. Friends, I pray, whatever the war may be that you are battling in this moment, that you may let Jesus Christ win the battle. Glory and honor be to his name. Amen. Now let us pray and kneeling down and invite God to be with us. Let us pray. Love and gracious Lord, we give you the honor and glory to your name. Lord, you who see us from heaven, I pray for those individuals, O oh Father, who have chosen to stand up for your glory. Lord, there are still many who sit, but in their hearts, O oh Father, they tremble to rise. And I just ask in the name of Jesus Christ that you may consider those individuals who offer a prayer of God have been merciful to me as sinner. I ask the young that you may come and draw nigh unto us. And that Father, you may help us to experience the joy of salvation that you desire to bestow into our lives. Father, in our lives there are many things, God. When we take time to examine ourselves, we can identify that are disconnecting us from you. But I, I pray, merciful, gracious Lord, that you please, God, give us the strength, give us the will to choose to set ourselves apart from the very things, O oh Father, that have disconnected us from you. And that, Lord, we may experience the peace of heaven within our lives. And I beg you, God, restore unto us the joy of salvation, if there be any that has lost it, Lord. We thank you, Father, today, that in all the messages that we hear, your goodness, your love for us to be saved prevails above every other message we can hear. And it is this thing that we are choosing to stand up to. We are choosing to rise up to. And I pray, Heavenly God, for those who have chosen to stand up for you, that you may please keep them standing. And that, Lord, their life may be an evident testimony of Father of the amazing power of God. Lord, we give you the honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.